Everybody finished their pre-section handout with our, with our table here. That'll be important. And um, so yeah, so please make sure you take your papers, your turn-ins. We've got two here. Any other groups have a, uh, the first assignment to turn in for the, uh, the policy paper? Who are we missing? Um, normally, yeah. So we ask for a hard copy, but it, it's fine. I can just print it from your email. It'll be, it'll be easier. Okay, cool. So that takes care of that. We've got all of those. Um, so this weekend section, we've got some of the hardest topics from this whole quarter. So this is kind of a, a big section, and uh, you know, just so just do your best to follow along as closely as you can. And we may need to revisit it again in office hours down the line, but just you know, keep, keep trying at it, and eventually it'll click. And this will be the type of thing that you'll remember sort of into you know, when you're CAs of the future. Because like, I kind of remembered this from, from when I took it. Um, so the first half of the section, we're going to be dealing with ideal markets without any externalities. So we're just going to be dealing with total cost, total benefits to society, and that'll be it. Um, the second half, we're going to turn to uh, externalities and market failure. So that'll be the case where we suddenly have external costs to take into account. And we'll try to show graphically how that um, sort of yields reductions in overall efficiency of the market. Um, okay, so for marginal analysis, you want to have your uh, marginal analysis uh, handout available, this one. And so you remember, you know, last week, two weeks ago, we had five policy evaluation criteria. So at this point, we're really diving into efficiency in depth. So today is pretty much all about efficiency, but don't forget about those other five, right? Because they're important as well. Political feasibility, risk, equity, all those things. Um, but today, we're looking deeply uh, into efficiency, when the benefits exceed the costs. Um, and we're going to dive into all of these curves of total cost, marginal, uh, net, in a very deep way. So these curves are going to be your best friends by the end of this section. Um, so our first big idea from this handout is the idea of incremental costs and incremental benefits. And what we mean by that is the marginal cost is how much more it costs you to buy one more additional item. And we'll, we'll illustrate that in a few different ways, but the marginal cost is how much more it costs to get one more unit of whatever item you're looking at. And we can do our efficiency analysis, how do we you know, determine if a policy is efficient or not, by looking at these marginal costs and these marginal benefits, as we'll see. Um, so we'll take this table, so we'll take a look at this. Um, and side note, the, the numbers on here are you know, somewhat unrealistic. They're just sort of very straightforward and simple. Um, you, know, you can imagine that you know, one gallon of gasoline isn't a dollar, but you know, just try to get the concepts. The, the important part is you know, the pattern of how these numbers change over time and how you calculate your marginal costs and your marginal benefits. And so together we're going to use marginal analysis of the marginal costs and the marginal benefits um, for each level of gas production to figure out which level is maximum, maximally efficient. Um, so we're going to start off, let's get three volunteers to fill out these three columns, the marginal cost, marginal benefit, and net benefit. So any three, come on up. Allison, go for one. Others? Yeah, go for it, Michelle. There you go. Yeah, you might want your paper. <laughs> One more. I'm going to do the, the total net benefits. Come on. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let's make sure these are coming out somewhat correct. Looking good so far. Thanks for making the hike, V. <laughs> Okay, and actually, before you guys go, so Alice, can you tell us how you got your marginal costs? Like, how did you find, come oh, to those God, numbers? Yeah. Um, it was just the difference between the total costs, like, per, like you said, like, for each added increment, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, okay, so, like, how did that one result? What did you sort of subtract uh, or add? I just did the one minus the zero that mm -hmm. we had, and then three minus the one that we like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you just sort of look at how much, you know, your difference. current costs yeah. are for... for you know, the second unit, second gallon of gas here, and then, you know, how much did it cost above and beyond what it cost to get the first unit. And that's how we get our marginal cost. Um, so marginal benefit, same sort of thing. And then V, how about uh, our total net benefit? Uh, so the net benefit is the total benefit minus the total cost. Yeah, so we're going to take our 
let's see, total benefits is this column, total costs is this column, and uh, yeah, like I said, benefit minus cost gives us our total net benefit. Um, okay, thank you guys very much. Keep my markers. So, anybody have any questions on how you know we got these numbers, how to do this sort of marginal cost, marginal benefit analysis? Okay, so this is going to be the basis for these three graphs, and you've got space on your handout for three different graphs, and we're going to take some of this data and graph it, starting with um, the total benefits and the total costs. So these curves should start to look kind of familiar to you at this point. Um, so let's see here. So we'll start with total benefit. So total benefit, we start off you know, at one unit of gas on our x-axis. We are at 11 units of benefit. Right, so we start off pretty high, um, and then as we go on and on, more units of gasoline is getting us, oh sorry, that's marginal, my bad. We want total benefits. So total benefits, they start off at 11, and then they increase, right? Because like with every additional gallon, you're getting more and more total benefit from that gas. So great. So as we go from one to six, our total benefits just sort of increases, increases, increases. And so that's going to give us a curve that you've seen before that looks kind of like this. And so this is going to be our total benefit. And then same thing if we're going to graph the, the total costs. Total costs are over here. Um, and they start off somewhat low, first gallon, second gallon, third gallon, but they accumulate over time. So they also increase, but they do so with a different, uh, different shape, different slope. OK, and so that's going to be our total cost. So you've seen this graph before, total benefit, total cost. Um, and Let's see. Yeah, so you can fill that out either on your, your marginal benefit handout or your, uh, the, the other handout for this section. OK, and so you know, from section last week, we looked at where is this graph maximally efficient. Anybody remind us, how did we find where uh, you know, we have maximum efficiency of production on this graph? What do we do? What do we look for? Yeah. Yes, right, where you know, the space between these curves is the greatest. And importantly for our marginal benefit and cost, it's the area where these, uh, or sorry, the, the quantity at which our slopes are equal. So that's going to give us our maximum, you know, ish, right about there is about our ideal quantity. And that's great. You can kind of eyeball that. OK, so, and if we want to look exactly at what level of production of a particular product is going to maximize the efficiency, we're going to start using our, our marginal analysis too. So our marginal cost and our marginal benefits. And so um, we want to figure out sort of how much bang for the buck do we get for each additional unit um, of production. In this case, we're doing gallons, gallons of gasoline. Um, and so that brings us to our marginal benefit and marginal cost curves. So let's see, we'll stick with green being our, our benefit. So marginal benefit. What is, uh, what is that one going to look like on this graph? Kind of draw it with your hand. Yeah, exactly. So we sort of start off high, and then we trail out low, right? Because this is graphing the slope of the total benefit curve gives us our marginal benefit curve. And you'll notice our units have changed on the y-axis, too. We go from dollars here, how many total dollars of benefit you have, to how much dollars per unit, how much value <coughs> per every incremental additional unit you have. Um, on this one. And so now we have marginal, uh, marginal benefit. And then marginal cost, if we're graphing our marginal cost, here we go, um, starts off very low, right, but then increases because more and more units of production, uh, each unit itself costs more than the ones before, at least for this example. So then we have our marginal cost. OK, so everybody caught the very important concept that this, uh, these marginal curves and marginal cost and marginal benefit is simply the slopes of these curves. And so you'll see this point. This is the point where the, the slope of the total cost curve and the slope of the total benefit curve are the same, where these two intersect. And that should be at the same quantity that we discovered up here um, is, again, our efficiency maximizing quantity. Um, and 
I'll use a couple calculus terms. It's fine if you don't remember them or don't, haven't taken calculus. But for those who have, of course, the, the marginal curves are just the first derivative of these benefit cost curves. The total curves take their first derivative to get your marginal curves. OK, we'll get to this third one, net benefits, in a moment. But before we do, uh, we're just recapping. We say that net benefits are maximized at the last unit produced on the x-axis where the marginal benefit still exceeds the marginal cost. And that's sort of how you're going to have to think about a chart like this. What is the last unit of production where the marginal benefits still exceed uh, the marginal cost? And so V very nicely sort of showed it's, it's at this level. <coughs> because here, as we go from 2, let's see, marginal benefit is 9. Marginal cost is 2. Great. So we should definitely produce up to 2 because our marginal benefits exceed the marginal cost. If we produce 3, great. Marginal benefit is 7. Marginal cost is 4. But then if we go and we produce four, all of a sudden, now they, they've crossed, right? They've switched places, and now the marginal benefit is less than the marginal cost. So that's how we know that, like, okay, if we're going in increments of gallons of gasoline and say we can only do one gallon at a time, then you have to stop at that three-gallon mark, okay? Um, okay, so any question? Yeah? Oh, yes, my sevens are notoriously look like greater than signs. Yeah, sevens. <laughs> That's an improvement, right? <laughs> yeah, you can look at those sevens and make you feel better. Um, OK, so and so you can see that on both of these graphs, sort of distance maximizing here, intersection here. Um, because after this point, if you keep on going and producing more gallons of gasoline, you can see that, like, okay, if we keep going in this direction, the areas between these curves get smaller, um, and the the marginal costs are now exceeding the marginal benefits. So you don't want to um, you don't want to do that. And we'll talk a little bit later on in this graph when we get over here as to sort of how we show that with areas under marginal curves. Okay, and so hopefully from the reading and from lecture, you remember that in an ideal market, the marginal benefit curve, this one, is the same thing as the demand curve. So we have two, two concepts, the marginal benefit and demand, but they're the same curve. They follow the same shape. And that's what we're going to do next is make the case as to why that is. We're going to walk through the construction of the marginal benefit curve so that you can see why it's equal to demand, as well as why marginal benefits diminish with increases in quantities consumed. OK. Um. All right, so what we're going to do now is construct our, first we're going to start with the marginal benefit curve. So we'll do that in red. Um, and we're going to go nice and easy, uh, gallons of gasoline produced down here. And let's see, where do you find this on your handout? This would be, yeah, so this is the big graph right in the middle of the bottom of your handout. So, okay, marginal benefit. So we're going to start off by, um, constructing our marginal benefit curve of how much benefit you get from different numbers of gallons of gasoline. So say you're at a position down here, zero gallons of gas. You're sort of stranded in the middle of somewhere and you can't get anywhere that you need to go. So that first <coughs> gallon of gas on this y-axis, we're, we're basically plotting how valuable is it to you to have that first gallon? How many dollars per unit um, are you going to get out of benefit of that first gallon? So is this going to be sort of very much higher or much lower than subsequent gallons? Higher. Higher, because it's very valuable. This first gallon of gas, um, you know, it's great. You know, you'd pay $100 just to get that gallon of gas, because then you can use that gallon of gas and you can get to work, so you can save your job. Say that's, you know, what you're trying to do, which is really, really great for you. Second gallon of gasoline, the marginal benefits from that additional uh, unit of gas in your gas tank it's still high, but it's not quite as high as that first unit. Because that first unit you can do a lot with. The second one, it's still helpful because now you can maybe go to the store on the way home and you can get food. Food is important too. But it's not as high. Now remember we're graphing here the marginal benefit, right? We're not graphing total benefit. If it was total benefit, we'd be adding these together and our curve would be going up. But we're doing marginal benefit, so it's going down. Um, and then the third unit of gas <coughs> purchased. With this third gallon, you can, you know, now you have enough gas to drive to work, drive to the store, and then you, know, you can drive and see your friends on the weekends. And you, you, you get value out of that, right? You're willing to pay for that. And that's how you get this marginal curve, is um, sort of people's willingness to pay for various quantities of gas. And so you can continue that logic out 
uh, to more and more units of gasoline. Okay. So we took the amount of gas on X and we plotted how much benefit on Y we got in dollars. So now the second step is how do we t make the case that this marginal benefit curve is the same thing as the demand curve. And so the demand, I'll put in blue again, Um, okay, so now this reflects, sort of, we're, we're going to sort of shift the way that we typically think about graphs. And almost all other graphs we've seen in 3B and 4B, um, you know, we look at our independent variable on X and we plot our dependent variable on Y. Now, when we're plotting demand, it's kind of reverse. We're going to think of our price here, sort of how much a gallon of gas dollars per unit costs, and we're going to see how much quantity are people willing to demand. Okay, so that's kind of a, a, a frame shift of, of the way of thinking about graphs is that we're going to be sort of varying things on the y-axis and seeing how, f how much quantity of gas they cause to be consumed on the x-axis. Um, so you're going to think about the price on y, um, you know, dollars per unit or uh, price, another way to think about it, as the independent variable, and then we're going to map the quantity on the x-axis. And so basically, what we're going to do is say we'll start at a high price. So up here we have uh, P1 or something. And we're going to think about how much gas are you going to buy if the price is at P1? How many gallons of gas? Think about that. Yeah, so we're only going to buy one gallon. We're only going to buy gas if the marginal benefit that we get for that gas is more than how much that gas costs. So this would be a crazy high price of gas, but let's just say it was up there. You know, you would be willing to buy that much gas. And that would continue all the way up to sort of right here. And if the price was higher than that, you wouldn't buy any gas. It wouldn't even be worth it to you to spend $200 off for that first gallon of gas or something like that. <clears throat> okay, but you wouldn't be willing to buy the second unit of gas because your, your benefit here, you know, say it's $50 for that second unit of gas, it's less than the price. So you're not going to go for it. Um, so imagine now that the price of gas is very low, and we'll put it right about here, so P2. So at this quantity, how much gas are you willing to buy? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I was shooting, f <coughs> yeah, okay, yes, yeah, so we'll say, we'll say five, because this price sort of continues out, no, wait a minute, no, no, we're going with four, because this kind of continues out here. So that fifth gallon, it, the marginal benefit is less than uh, what you would get. And so similarly, you can vary the price here and see how much you're willing to buy along the, the x-axis here for all of these different uh, quantities of gas and all of these different prices on y. And so that, so, and if we're going to sort of smooth this out, sort of average it, add it all up together for society or something like that, this is where we get this curve, which ideally looks something like that. And this is our uh, demand curve. So you basically determine what quantity of gas that you would buy based on the price on the y-axis. Yeah, Jesse. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, if this, if your marginal benefit for the first gallon was $100 and it cost $100, you'd be like, eh, like I wouldn't buy it if it was 101 but it's 100 so I'll buy it and I'll, and I'll go for it. Yeah, and so that's how to think about it from like an individual's perspective. But of course, when we're talking about these graphs, we're sort of adding together all of the individuals to sort of get a societal curve, this overall demand curve. And so we basically just made the case that the marginal benefit which we did in red bars here, is the same curve as the demand curve. Yeah? Um, so because this curve is concave up, mm -hmm. I guess, then the marginal benefit would be less than the price. Mm -hmm. So would it be Yeah. Everybody buys more than one gallon of gas, but then yeah. 
because usually, you know, the price is, you know, set. It's like down here and, you know, I'll just fill up my tank for whatever price because I'm willing to buy that much. But I see your point, like the, the shape of this curve necessarily, it's like that's, it's sort of like the, the conceptual case, the theoretical case. It's, you know, that's to sort of make it match up with this, the marginal benefit curve, which we can now also call the demand curve. Um, and some goods, um, you know, and you don't have to worry about this, this is sort of beyond our scope, you know, in economics your goods can be elastic or inelastic in their demand. And so in this case, we have a demand that's very elastic. It changes a lot at, as the price changes. But other goods, it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much what the price is. Um, I have an example of what an inelastic good would be. I'm trying to think, like, like it doesn't really matter how much um, Electricity, yeah, it's like, it, you know, the, the price of electricity can change a lot, but people still kind of have to use a certain amount. Um, so, okay, so that's sort of uh, in, into that realm. Um, okay, so now if you flip to the back of your handout, we've got our first two learning goals there. We've, got, we've done those two, so it's a monumental task, and so this would be a good point for any other questions that you have about what we've done so far, and if you feel good about those first two learning goals calculating the marginal cost benefits and net benefits, and then demonstrating that the marginal benefit curve is the same as the demand curve. Is that looking okay? Any questions? Okay. Um, and so one thing that would be good for you to do to practice, to go home, is try to do the same thing from the other perspective, from the marginal cost perspective. And what, what curve does the marginal cost curve correspond to? Supply. Supply. Um, so being able to think through that would be good. All right, so now we'll turn, we'll return back to our net benefits graph, so the one that we kind of skipped over earlier. Um, in this example, we're assuming that you can only get increments of gasoline in one whole gallon, right? One gallon, two gallons, three gallons. In our example, there's no <laughs> half gallons, there's no tenths of gallons or anything like that. Um, and we determined which quantity of gas would yield the greatest net benefit, which was how many gallons? Three gallons, right? Because that was the last point at which our marginal benefits exceeded our marginal cost. And so there's basically, as it says at the bottom of your handout, there's two ways to go about doing this, like we talked about. Um, the first one is the way that we did before, which was to look at net benefits and see at what point the net benefits still exceed the cost, but then the next unit, the net benefits do not exceed the cost. So that's one way of figuring out the, the efficiency maximizing point. The second way um, is just to look and see where our, our total net benefits uh, are the greatest. And so you'll notice this net benefit column, we didn't have to look at marginal benefits, we didn't have to look at marginal costs to get the net benefits, we just looked at total benefits and total costs. And so, let's see here. And so we want to get as close as we can to the efficiency maximizing point without crossing it. Because once you start crossing it, then you're, um, you're incurring more costs than it is actually worth to you in terms of benefit. And so returning to the chart from the beginning of section net benefits number three, um, if we're going to graph the net benefits, take like 30 seconds, work with the person next to you, try to draw this curve. What would it look like? feeling, looks like, it looks like people have that down correctly at this point. Um, okay, so net benefits, to get our net benefits, um, we're going to take, you know, just sort of graphing what this curve would look like. Um, and so it starts off low and uh, sort of increases at our peak and then sort of goes back down again. So yeah, we sort of have this inverted U, again, with our ideal quantity being where those net benefits are maximized. So, was there any, any questions that bubbled up throughout that? I have a quick question yeah. about the curves. Yeah. Um, in this class, are we going to be and, like, using straight lines for supply and demand? Um, yes, yeah. So, once we get over here, um, just to sort of make our areas a little easier to follow, 
um, will we'll straighten out these lines. And that would just, it, it, it doesn't really represent any major conceptual shift. It's just sort of for ease of using our graphs. Okay. And so you'll notice that like these three graphs are lined up on top of each other because this x axis down here, sorry, which I neglected to label, it's the same in all of them, but it's the, you know, the quantity. That's what that says. Um, quantity or like units of gasoline consumed or produced. And so this quantity is the same throughout all, all of these different graphs. So that way you can show sort of what our ideal quantity is using any, any one of these three different, uh, different graphs, different ways of measuring it. Okay, so what we've just done is looked at how to do this marginal analysis deal and how the market uh, cost and benefit curves intersect in an ideal market, a market without externalities, a market where uh, everybody has sort of pure information and free choice of, of what to buy and things like that. But then not all markets are like that. And now we're going to get to the case where we have a little bit more of a complicated scenario. And this is, of course, the case of externality. So now we're on to our fourth bit of section and doing well on time as well. And so basically, the big picture here is all this talk of supply and demand, marginal costs, marginal benefits. It assumes that the market's operating ideally, but when we have externalities, um, the market isn't ideal and we have to sort of be able to demonstrate using a graph um, why it's not ideal, what exactly is going on with this market that makes it less than ideal. So there's, uh, there should be, yes, yeah, so there's a definition on your handout of what an externality is. Um, so it says the externality is a byproduct or consequence of the production or consumption of a good or a product that isn't paid for by the producer or the consumer of the product. So it's that byproduct that's not captured in that sort of one-to-one -one market transaction. It's some other consequence that hits the rest of society. And it can be a good thing or a bad thing. In, you know, in environmental policy, climate change, we usually talk about externalities being uh, bad things because there are all these consequences associated with greenhouse gas uh, combustion and things like that. So you might remember back from PSET 1, we had the example of smoking cigarettes. Um, you know, so let's imagine what the individual transaction, the private market transaction looks like. An individual buys a relatively cheap pack of cigarettes um, and neither the tobacco industry or the, the consumer of the cigarettes pays for the negative effects that those cigarettes have possibly on other people through the idea of secondhand smoke. Um, and so nobody is necessarily paying for that impact. So taking this as an example, let's think through like what would be the, the different thing, the different, um, the different concepts represented in that example. So what would be the, the benefits in the case of uh, buying a pack of cigarette? What, what's the benefit there? You're employing a lot of people in the tobacco industry. Okay, so that's like, that's a, a good thing with the association of, of cigarettes. But in terms of like the, the utility, the benefit, like what, why is this person buying cigarettes? Just Yeah, it's like whatever people, whatever reason people smoke cigarettes for, um, that's the you know that's the the benefit that this individual is receiving from this transaction, um, and we can quantify that basically by like how much value, how much is it worth to consumers to buy a pack of cigarettes? So I don't know, they're like three dollars, five dollars, something like that. Um, and then, so what about the the private cost? So now we're going to be introducing private cost versus social cost. So what's the private cost in the transaction of cigarettes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just how much does it cost the producers to provide the cigarettes? And then what's the externality? The secondhand smoke. And so you, you know, in, an externality is going to be some sort of uh, you know, quantified thing. So it's going to be sort of the, the negative health costs of secondhand smoke would be more specific. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so the, the cost curve is the, the supply curve, and this is sort of from the producer end of things. We talked through marginal benefit and demand. This is from the consumer end of things, and then the flip side of this is the producer's end of things. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that would, that would be, so if the person who's buying the cigarettes, um, that would probably rep be represented in like a decrease of benefits to that person. Um, so it's not really that they like bear an extra cost, although maybe you could say that, but like it, it's really that the benefits that they're getting, what we talked about whatever benefits you get from smoking cigarettes, is actually less because eventually you might get, you know, increased chance of lung cancer or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so in this graph, you look at the benefit from the consumer's mm -hmm. perspective, mm -hmm. but you look at the private cost from the producer's perspective? Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. And so then that brings us to like our final term, which is uh, social cost. So social cost equals, what does social cost equal? Yeah. So now we've got the private cost that we talked about, right? Which is just sort of how much the, it costs the producer to make it. Um, the private cost plus the social cost. Sorry, sorry, plus the external cost. <coughs> okay. Um, and so now follow along with me on the handout as we sort of draw out our marginal uh, co private cost and marginal benefit graph for just any generic market case. So now we're sort of divorcing ourselves of any examples or just sorry, in general, what does this uh, market situation look like? So we're going to start off essentially drawing this graph. Um, we're going to straighten out the lines just to make the graph a little easier to work with. Um, but to start off, we have our marginal benefit line. Marginal benefit, which is the same as supply. So get that one down. And then before we get into what the externalities are, we just have a private cost. So, um, and then we have our marginal private cost. Uh, oh yes, my bad. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is demand. Marginal private cost or supply. And yes, this one is demand. Okay, so at this point, um, so we'll get sort of some various things going on our axes here. So over here we've got sort of prices, like how much does each thing cost in dollars per unit and how many of these things are you making? So we can imagine we're like it, we could produce at Q1, we could produce at Q2, we could produce at Q3, um, we could, and then prices we'll explain in a moment but say we have you know, a couple prices, P1, P2, P3. <coughs> so in this case, before we introduce externalities, what quantity is this market going to settle on? And so think about that for a second before you answer to let everybody think. But what quantity is this market, if it's just sort of an, a free, unregulated market at equilibrium, what quantity of units is it going to be producing and people consuming? Q2, and at what price will that, uh, will these be goods at? P2. P2, so Q2 is right here at the intersection of our curves, and then the price at that quantity is over here at P2. Wait, Q2 is before we have to work in, or? Q2 is down here, this is just sort of like showing arbitrary like quantities of production, so we could produce fewer, middle, even more, or something so like that. What Yeah, so these could be packs of cigarettes, gallons of gasoline, units of electricity, anything like that. Okay, and so then if we're drawing, if we're including the presence of externalities, what do we add to this graph? And what's that? So social cost is going to be private cost plus external cost. Um, so yes, we're going to be adding a curve that helps um, show that uh, we've got an external cost going on here, and so this one is going to be the marginal social cost. And so you'll see that this one is the same thing as the marginal private cost, it's just shifted up to the top. Okay, and then if we had um, you know, controls in place 
that internalized this, this externality, this extra above and beyond the private cost, um, we would be producing and consuming at a new level. So it would be more close to Q1 over here um, because that would be where our new intersection of marginal social cost and, and marginal benefit is. And it would be close, I meant to put P1 a little lower, but it'll be over here. This will be our new P1. And so that would be the new quantity and the new price at which the good would exist. And then we'll see why being at this point in terms of this graph is a benefit. Why, what, what, what good to society is, do we have of being at this quantity of production as opposed to this quantity of production? Yeah, Josephine. In general, are the slopes of the marginal social cost and the marginal private cost the same? Yeah, they are, for our purposes, kind of usually parallel, the same. Um, you can imagine sometimes they might that they might be different because maybe with more production, it, you know, it's a, like sort of this compounded social cost. But for our purposes, yeah, they're parallel and we'll go with that. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna look at externalities from the producers and society's perspective. And so the question, like, you know, on PSATs exams, what you're gonna be asked is, you know, how is the market different when we produce at, say, Q2 as opposed to Q1 or something like that? And that's the example that we're gonna run through right now. And so now one thing that is really important to understand is that the total cost or the total benefit is represented by the areas under the marginal benefit or the, the marginal cost curves. Okay, so that's how we go from these idea of marginal costs to total costs or from marginal benefits back to total benefits is we take the area under the curve or in calculus terms, you just integrate the curve uh, within certain boundaries on the x-axis. And so we, you find the area and that gets us back to this total cost. And that gets us from cost per unit, dollars per unit, back up to total dollars. And so those will be the, the units of the things that, that come out at the end of this. Okay, so now Sarah Market is producing, um, let's see, at Q1. So say we're at Q1, sort of we, we've internalized the externality, we levied some tax or we've restricted production here. And let's think about why a producer might want to move from Q1 to Q2. Um, and we'll see, you know, say the, mar the, the market doesn't care about externalities anymore or something. What, is to, to, what changes as we go from Q1 to Q2? So to do that, um, we're going to create sort of our areas under our curves here because we're going from Q1 to Q2. Um, so you can imagine basically everything to the right of my arm doesn't exist yet. Like we haven't gone there in this market. We've only produced up to Q1. But now we're going to open up some new areas as we go from Q1 to Q2. And we're going to say what exactly is the, the benefit and cost of moving there. And so I'm going to label our different areas, A, B, and C. And so now as we go from Q1 to Q2, or let's see, on your handout it says uh, Q star to Q market, but for our purpose it's the same thing as Q1 to Q2. Um, <clears throat> the total private cost of moving from Q1 to Q2. So so the total private cost, what would be uh, represented by the total private cost of that move? C. So we're going from Q1 to Q2, and like we said, to go from the marginal curves to the total, you integrate the area under the curve, or you take the area. You, or, so you integrate the curve, or you take the area under the curve. So our total private cost is C. And what about the total benefit of moving from Q1 to Q2? So take a minute, think about that before you answer. Okay, so what's the total benefit of going from Q1 to Q2? B plus, B plus C. And then just like over here, in order to find our net benefits, what you do is you just, um, you do your total benefits minus your total costs, get you your net benefits. So if our total benefits are B plus C, and we're just subtracting C, that leaves us with just B. And so then you can see, basically, once we take into account our costs and our benefits, this area right here of B 
That's the area of, ben of net benefit associated with going from Q1 to Q2 from just the private perspective. Because we haven't taken into account yet the social cost, but just the private cost. So now we have to go from society's perspective. Okay, so now same thing from Q1 to Q2, except now we have total social cost. And this one, figure out on your own. So I want everybody to be able to say, what is the total cost, the total social cost associated with going from Q1 to Q2? So work on that for a moment. And then if you've got that already, work on these next two, total benefit and the net social cost of going from Q1 to Q2 or Q star to Q market. Now take one minute, turn to the person next to you and see if you agree. See if you got the same thing. And hopefully you'll figure out any... Uh... Yeah. All right, 10 seconds. All right, so let's, uh, let's run through this one, see how that all worked out. So somebody want to offer what do we get for total social cost? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was A and C or just A. Okay, total social cost. Um, so social cost is going to be the entire area under the marginal social cost curve. A, yeah, so it's A, B, and C because like it's just this curve and the entire area underneath it. So total social cost, A plus B plus C. All right. Okay, now how about total benefit? Yeah, so green is our marginal benefit curve, so it's B and C. And so you can see, basically, you know, what's the difference between our costs and our benefits? Okay. Do we have, yeah, so do we have more costs or more benefits? More costs. Right, because our B and C kind of goes away and we're left with this extra cost of A, so our net social cost being A. If we asked what was the net social benefit, oh, okay. then it would be negative A, but since we say, we're saying it's a cost, then it's A. And so basically that, that's this area here. So this is the area that if we go from Q1 to Q2, uh, that's the area that um, represents the cost to society the, the extra, that nobody is paying. <coughs> okay. And so basically, this, uh, the, the externality itself is represented by the, the height, the distance between these two curves. So here, the, the height, and this isn't an area, this is just a height that we're talking about. Uh, this is our external 
cost. That's the size of the externality. And so if we were trying to, you know, so now we decided like, okay, our market, if we just let it be sort of a free market and go to Q2, um, we produce, you know, it, it's not efficient. The market has failed in some sense because it produces this extra cost, um, extra cost to society. And so we can try to fix that using two different ways. So what are the two different ways we could go about trying to fix that? Yeah. Tax. So we can, we can put a tax. And if we were going to levy a tax, we would want it to be the size of this external cost. We would want it to be that big. So whatever you know, height that is in, in dollars, that's how much per unit you want your tax to be. Yeah. And that's not putting a tax on the item, that's putting a tax on the producer. Well, it could go either way. And it would actually have the same effect. Um, because it's going to change the price of the object. And so then that's going to make this curve shift back to produce at this quantity. So that's one way to do it. And what's the other way we could go about doing it? Regulation. Yeah, regulation. Um, and so for that, what we might say is we're not going to touch the prices from our policy perspective. We're just going to restrict the quantity to Q1. So be like, you guys can produce at Q1, and that's all. Because we know if we produce beyond Q1, then we start incurring these extra costs to society. OK, so that takes us through the end of learning goal number three. So number three, you're supposed to be able to manipulate these cost-benefit curves, the marginal cost, marginal benefit curves, and see how they work in ideal and external markets. So any, any further questions I can help with at this point before we uh, do a quick real world example. Yeah, yeah, take us back through the social cost. Yeah. Like uh, how we got this part, mm -hmm. total social cost. Yeah, so basically, just like we did up here, <laughs> total private cost, right? So we did total private cost by looking at the marginal private cost curve, and we took how much area was underneath that, and it was just C, right? But then we added this extra curve because we put the externality in. And then we have a new curve with the marginal social cost. And then we took the area under that curve. And so this curve, the area underneath it, represents this whole trapezoid right here. Um, and so that's why it's A plus B plus C. OK? Does that make sense? Any? Yeah. OK. Others, any other questions? Yeah. I guess um, the difference between private cost and externality, is it Mm -hmm. Always strictly like whether or not the individual who is personally like directly paying for the item is, I guess, hurt or benefited as opposed to any other indiv strictly individual who is being hurt or benefited from something that they are themselves not directly paying for. Yeah, so in terms of like who does this external cost kind of apply to, yeah. it's, it's all of society. Um, you know, probably averaged out to some amount. Like if you if it's secondhand smoke from a pack of cigarettes, obviously that doesn't hit all 300 million people in the United States. But sort of if we were doing an entire market analysis of cigarettes, there would be some external cost averaged out. And yeah. I just I'm I guess I'm confused when you when thinking about like uh, maybe like you have a spouse who smokes, right? Mm -hmm. Because like you you share your money, but they're the ones who are themselves smoking and like mm -hmm. directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't know. I would have to think through that one in terms of like sharing money and then buying yeah. it and like getting or like affected. Or, you know, any yeah. Situation where like you have a little group that like more or less is together in mm -hmm. when they do certain things. Yeah. Or when they act as a, as a consumer. Okay, I'll have to defer that one for like after section or office hours or something. Um, but maybe it'll become clear a little bit more when we do a real world example of gasoline. So now the last page of your handout, we get to some, a little bit of data. So we've got these two, these people, Perry and Small, the authors of these papers. Um, and they put forth uh, some suggestions in terms of how big the, the US gas tax should be. So you can kind of tell from this graph, but does anybody know how much on average is gasoline taxed per gallon? How much money? What do you think? Any guesses? Twenty-five cents per gallon. Okay. Other guesses. No, 
125 cents per gallon. <laughs> yeah, so the, the average, um, I checked recently, um, the current average in all the different states in the country is about 48 cents per gallon. And the Perry and Small paper right here, so they suggest that the optimal gas tax in order to really be most efficient would be a dollar and one cent. And this is in 2002 dollars, so it would be a little bit more uh, today. But their analysis, you can see that they take into account some global warming externalities, some pollution externalities, congestion, accidents. All of these things are external costs associated with the consumption of gasoline that isn't taken into account by people buying the gas or selling the gas. And so you'll see at the bottom of this uh, page, this is a great set of take home questions. And I really recommend that you sort of practice this, try to recreate these sort of graphs, answer these questions in relationship to the tax, um, and that'll be some really good practice for you. So I know this is a big section, lots of concepts and things like that, and it may not fit the first time, but just keep practicing, come to office hours, and um, you'll definitely be able to get it eventually. And so just keep working at it, and thanks guys, I'll see you, see you next week. My office hours are 11.